Who am I? Um, well, I think the first thing people usually say is that I am Malcolm X's daughter, right? Some people say I am Dr. Betty Shabazz's daughter. Oh, you said who am I? Should I have said I am Ilyasa Shabazz? Hi, it's Kate Shiller from Electronal. As protests sweep the nation, the United States re-examines its history of racial and social injustice. My next guest is no stranger towards the fight for liberation. In a new audio release of her widely celebrated memoir, Ilyaza revisits her childhood as the daughter and granddaughter of activists. Here's Ilyaza Shabazz on Growing Up X. Okay, so you mentioned you were Malcolm X's daughter. So what is it like for you when you are seeing how he's described in history, in textbooks? Um, and what would you change about how he's been portrayed? Um, what? Okay. Many times they refer to my father as an agitator, right? And some other words that are usually inaccurate because I don't think they're looking that at a man who is extremely compassionate, who's very bright, who um, is extremely responsible, and who believes in human rights for all. And so he challenged the inequities, the injustices, um, you know, of our times and, and, and the historical um, challenges. And I think today we are seeing all of these horrific issues, right? These horrific um, incidents and occasions. Um, and now we are turning to Malcolm and we realized that this was his reaction to these things that we didn't realize were there. But my father was so reticent. He read every single book you can imagine when he was in prison and when he got out, you know? And so he did, as indicated in the Audible of the Autobiography of Malcolm X, this magnificent educational training for himself. And so what has it been um, like for you to be able to control his narrative? You know, you have a few books that, you know, detail his childhood and his life. Well, you know, for me, I feel so honored that I could um, uh, address some of the images that were portrayed of my father, especially of his family and his childhood. Um, and that is largely due to his eldest sister, Hilda, my aunt Hilda. And she used to say to me, Ilyasa, you know, you know, there were some, you know, things that were in the book. And, you know, she would say, your father was not even six years old when our father was lynched. And so he may not have understood the dynamics of his parents, of their family, of, you know, of what was going on during the height of the Jim Crow era and the height of the uh, Great Depression. And so I was able to show that uh, Malcolm's father was the chapter president of the Garvey movement, which commanded millions of followers worldwide, right? And in the 1920s and in the early 30s before he was lynched. And that his mother was the national recording secretary. You know, she was one of the, the writers and so she would take a lot of the periodicals um, and, and have her children read them to her. And that was a way of showing them that they were global citizens, you know, and also ensuring their love for education, that their love for literary, their love for leadership and, and compassion. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just so happy that I was able to show that you don't go to jail and miraculously become Malcolm X. It's really important that we have parents who are um, providing great tutelage for our children. And in the absence of parents, that it really does take a village to raise a child. And so it speaks to the importance of all of us smart, forward-thinking adults you know, of protecting and being responsible for however our children are, are grow up and whoever they develop into and become. And then, so is this something that, you know, historians, is that something you found out through research or, you know, family stories? Like, have you been speaking a lot to his siblings? Did you get a chance to speak to his parents? Um, things like that. My grandparents, so my grandfather was lynched, right? And then they put my grandmother 
um, you know, in that time when they would, you know, unfortunately target the families that are being progressive, you know, and, and they had names for them back then. And, um, and so my grandparents were progressives and they were activists and they were instilling, you know, these particular values in their children. And so their family was targeted after his father was lynched, uh, seven years later, you know, they put his mother in an in institution and fortunately she reached out to some of her friends, a uh, West Indian friends, because she was from Grenada and said, if these people ever take me away, make sure you raise my children and make sure you instill these values, the Garvey, the Garvey principles and values of self um, reliance, you know, and education. And so my parent, my father's um, siblings, my aunts and uncles, you know, were very insightful. They were beautiful, warm, like really good people. And um, so I was very fortunate that, you know, over the years, having conversations with them, and especially my Aunt Hilda, that, you know, I could go, I could relay back to those conversations um, and I could address, you know, and, and, and appropriate um, who her father and who, I mean, who my father's father and mother were. So lots of research and family yeah. chats. And then hearing all of these ideas, um, is this something that you originally embraced? Is it something that, you know, you were hesitant about or you were confused and had to learn more? Like how, how is that as, you know, as a young person first hearing these ideas and, um, you know. You know, I'm really uh, fortunate that my mother raised the six, her six daughters, you know, she seemed to be invincible. You know, she made us, she gave us a very solid foundation. You know, we didn't see her cry, you know, growing up. She had witnessed her husband being gunned down, um, her home being firebombed. So she evidently, you know, had been traumatized, but we never knew that. And I, of course, discovered it when I got older and I started learning about all the things that happened. And I said, my gosh, mommy, you know, how were you able to, you know, how were you able to, to do all the things that you did and raising six girls and, you know, sending us to summer camp in Vermont with, you know, Native American and Quaker values, learning how to make maple syrup, you know, how to horseback ride, all of these things. She wanted to make sure that we grew up with a lot of love, with a lot of uh, compassion, um, self-reliance. And so by the time we got older, you know, we had been, you know, pretty solid in our identity and our foundation and anything that we wanted to do, we knew we could do because my mother never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself. And so if we see our mother, you know, like doing everything Wonder Woman, then certainly whatever we want to do, we can. And I know a couple of times, you know, I was, I've been very fortunate to work with some really dynamic novelists. And, and a few times, um, you know, I think they were hesitant. And so I'm thinking, you know, no, you know, because this is how it was. And this is, you know, and, and, and I know that, you know, so there was never a moment where I felt like, you know, I couldn't talk about the pyramids being in Africa. You know, this is like 10 years ago, you know, when we weren't really talking about it or just certain things that, or, or, you know, the KKK, uh, Black Legion, um, lynching my grandfather. So I've never really been, um, you know, reluctant to um, tell the truth or, you know, do work that I know, I hope will inspire all children, you know, whether they, you know, are from the African diaspora, from the Americas, indigenous, indigenous of America, wherever they are in the world, that they recognize that all of us made significant contributions to history. It's not just white men, you know, but that we all have ancestors who made significant contributions and there's enough room for everyone to have, you know, this feeling of self-worth and self-love and not rely on others to define who we are, to define our value. And then you mentioned trauma. So that's something, you know, that has existed for centuries among, you know, the Black American community. Um, how do you think that is 
you know, come, what relationship do you think that has with us finding self-worth, with uh, self-empowerment and self-sufficiency within the Black community, coming to terms with our yeah. past trauma? Right. You know, it's just a, such an unfortunate situation, but in spite of all of the trauma that we've endured, look at us thrive, right? But I think what's so important is that we control the narrative and telling all this, you know, the stories that are missing from our history books, you know, because if we're going to honor the founding forefathers and foremothers of this modern country, right, because certainly um, it existed and people were thriving. There were pyramids here in the Americas. Um, there was, you know, scholars and astronomers and farmers and, you know, and physicists, right, already here before Christopher Columbus came. Uh, came. And so to be then conditioned, right, based on lies, you know, based on being miseducated and misinformed, and, and then also making it illegal to have education, um, now that we can, well, then it's extremely important to find out, well, what are they trying to keep from us? You know, what is that, you know, and then the necessity of education. Everyone should have the opportunity to be educated. All parents want their children to have that opportunity for a quality education and to know that they're worthy of it. And so once we understand that we were not, that our history, once we understand that our history did not begin in slavery, then that's an opportunity for self-love. That's an opportunity for self-respect. That's an opportunity to love others. That's an opportunity to respect others. And so there's a much more cohesive family unit. Uh, you know, and I think this is one of the reasons why um, today, since we are discovering the truths of, um, you know, of history, of, of, of education, of information, um, it, it must be why when we saw George Floyd being just killed so, so, so brutally that many people were incensed and outraged and, 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 and they realized that this is not a black and white issue. This is an issue of right and wrong. And, and this means that we have the capacity to be compassionate and we have the capacity to care and, and we have the capacity to see right from wrong. And so we had people in 50 states in this country during the summer that marched, protested, demonstrated every single day in spite of a pandemic, right? In 18 countries abroad, every day in spite of a pandemic because they believe that Black Lives Matter means that Black power isn't exclusionary, right? But that it is total. And it means that none of us are free until all of us are free. And so we recognize that we are all a part of this human family. And we do not want to see anyone in our family suffering so traumatically, you know, through such terror. So what is your vision for an ideal America? Oh my gosh. <laughs> ideal America, can you imagine, Cage, if we did not have to focus on injustice, I mean, my gosh, every, every time I wake up, you know, I look at my phone and it seems like I'm seeing a killing. I wake up, I'm happy. I want to post about, you know, pastries and cake and cookies. I want to post about, you know, some really beautiful fashion. I want to post about something really great. You know, I was a biology major, so I love nature. I want to post about something really warm and exciting, but I'm bombarded by these images of, of killings, you know? And so just imagine if we didn't have all of that, right? If we didn't have injustice and inequities and, and, and people have the opportunity to be educated, right? And to feel love and to feel, um, you know, that they're worthy of love and, and loving. What a wonderful life that would be because then we could focus on our true passions, right? And so instead of thinking that it's unrealistic, let's, let's you know, have reach for those kinds of goals, you know, because when we all want change, but we have to understand that 
Change doesn't happen magically. Change happens when we do the work. And so that's why we had so many, you know, marching and protesting and demonstrating. And so what we have to do is strategize, organize, and, and you know, and let's go. Let, let's go. But this is a moment that is right for regenerative growth. And that is what we're doing at the Shabazz Center. We have this excellent uh, young woman that we just hired, uh, Masters of Divinity from Harvard, and she's the Director of Institutional Advancement, and she is so dynamic, you know? And so we have um, these great discussions, virtual, of course, now, of all of the activities and, and curricula that we're going to implement um, right from the Shabazz Center. And I just want to say her name, just in case you can share it. And her name is um, Naja Zigby Johnson, and she's absolutely spectacular. Um, and then, so I guess two things. First, how do we make um, teaching about compassion and instilling passion something that is expressed, uh, you know, through an interfaith perspective? Uh, we see you know, a Christian perspective kind of dominating how America has created laws and things like that. Um, and then your, you know, religion was important to your father and your mother as well. So how do you make that an interfaith experience and so that we can instill what compassion truly means um, in America? Yeah, um, you know, my father likely discovered um, such compassion um, and, you, you know, I would imagine because of his, his, his relationship um, with God through his faith. And it's just having particular values, right? And it's really values of righteousness. You know, it makes your life so much more peaceful and joyful and, and beautiful. And, and, you know, so I'm really grateful that these are uh, the, this is the foundation um, on which my mother raised her six girls. You know, everything we did had to do with nature and had to do with any, any breathing um, cre creature, right? So that we had compassion for, which I just did, was not a bug person, but my sister, she used to have these horrible, I just thought it was disgusting, these cocoons, you know, but when the cocoons turned into butterflies, then it made it beautiful. And so you got this appreciation for life, you know, from the smallest breathing creature to the largest of, you know, of us. And so we grew up really believing in um, the, the um, brotherhood of, of man and woman, brotherhood, sisterhood of man, and the oneness of, of man and the oneness of God. And then, so how do we educate um, about our experience without it becoming trauma porn? You know, so many people learned about our daily life from seeing the killing of George Floyd um, and hearing about Breonna Taylor and things like that. And the first instance we have of us in textbooks is slavery. So how do we better educate um, or, you know, share our story without it being based on our trauma? Well, listen, the fact is that there has been trauma, right? And we need to understand that everyone, you don't have to be uh, a descendant of, of enslaved people to understand and recognize trauma. You should have compassion for it regardless and, and make sure that it is never repeated again as it was um, with, you know, in the Mexican border. And so trauma and terror is trauma and terror and it has nothing to do with being black or white you know, it has nothing to do with being Asian or African or European. Trauma is trauma. It has to do with right and wrong. And so I think, uh, for instance, with enslaved um, Africans, right, enslaved indigenous people from who were already here, that if we would control the narrative, right, then we would be able to make sure that when we're talking or, and referencing our founding forefathers and, and foremothers, that there are a whole, uh, there's a whole group of people who've been left out. 
And so had it not been for our enslaved ancestors who were refined and industrious Africans, refined and industrious indigenous people, that we would not have the opportunity to call the United States of America the leader of the free world, the leader of, of so many things, we wouldn't have the opportunity to call it, this country our home. And so it's our responsibility to make sure that this information right, is included in our educational curriculum throughout the year, and not only in 30 or 28 days, which says your life, it doesn't matter. It, does, it doesn't need to be included in our educational curriculum. You have 28 days, go ahead and do it the best you can in, those short, in that short time. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, um, so your father said, I'm gonna paraphrase, the ballot, is as important or as effective as the bullet. So we have a presidential election coming up as well as you know state uh, offices up for grabs, things like that. So do you have any advice for the younger generation um, as the election comes? Yes, I think that we need to just get out there and we need to vote. We need to understand the political process. Um, this political moment was marked by COVID-19, right? And, and the failures of our government, we realize that um, those in power have misused it. And so we want change. And so we have to recognize that change comes with our vote. Change comes with being informed, being, uh, um, being organized, being strategic understanding um, the, 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 the processes, the laws, policies, and so forth. Um, for those who don't understand, you know, instead of talking about them, let's bring them in and let's educate them, right? And then once we put whomever it is that we're supporting in office, we have to continue to do our part and make sure that they're living up to all the promises that they made for us. And then, so speaking of the youth, they've become such an important part of your work. Why did you choose to focus on them? You know, I, I love me, right? I love me. My mother made sure of it. And just as I love me, I love you, right? I love the youth. I, when I see anyone who has been denied an opportunity to love themselves, then I try to find ways to, uh, to let them understand their value, their worth, the importance of having your own value system so that you're never relying on someone else to define your worth, right? But that in order to be your friend, in order to be your partner, your mate, whatever it is, right, that, that they have to have similar values. And, and if they don't, then, you know, unfortunately, that means, you know, you want to have a great life, my mother said, just as one must drink water, one must give back. But in order for you to give back, you have to come from some really good stock, right? You have to have, you know, that capacity for self-love, self-worth, and not allow your foundation to be uh, shaken. And so speaking of your mother, at what point did you realize that you wanted to write about her? My mother? Mm-hmm. Was there like one moment that you realized like this is this is a superwoman? I need to cover her childhood, cover her life. Well, you know, I thought it would just be a great um, opportunity to write a story about you know girl things, you know, and and it was also an opportunity to um, talk about Brown versus the Board of Education, the 1940s, the activism during that time, the the you know just what life was about and, and show our history um, in a, show our history in a novel form that was inspirational and exciting for young girls, you know, and boys to open up a book and see a reflection of themselves, you know, and have similar questions that they would have um, in the character of my mother as a child. And, and also, you know, an opportunity to talk about, you know, the accomplishments that they made even back then or that, they got dressed up, they put on their Sunday finest when they went marching and protesting, which I found fascinating. And that my mother played the drums, you know, and that, you know, she, they liked um, music, just a whole bunch of things, you know, it was just such a fun time to be dancing in Detroit in your bedroom with your friends, to be polishing your nails, and then also talk about 
you know, racism and self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. And then, so how is your father's presence kept alive uh, growing up in your household? Oh gosh, my, my mother was really uh, great. She did an excellent job. She wanted to make sure that, you know, since our father was just tragically um, gunned down, like, and she wanted to make sure that her daughters grew up not feeling that their father left them, but that their father was still a part of, you know, our household and a, a part of our development. And so um, she kept a lot of his books around and all of his clothes and things, you know, were there, his shoes, um, his size 15 shoes. I used to, you know, put my feet in them because I had the biggest feet in the house and march around, clonk them, around in them. But, you know, she wanted to make sure that we knew that our father loved us and that we were very clear on who he was, you know, how he was compassionate, uh, loving, uh, um, believe it or not, a lenient, and so forth. Ilyaza comes into her own, taking in her predecessor's lessons on resilience and empowerment. The product, her own legacy impacting youth, education, and a new outlook for the disenfranchised. So what was the writing process like for Growing Up X? Was it emotional? Did you feel like it was easy? Growing Up X was really interesting because I wrote it years ago with this really amazing woman, um, Kim McLaren. And I thought some of the things that we were talking about, I'm like, who wants to know about that? But now, you know, I realize that, oh, uh, that, um, you know, it is a part of growing up. And, and a lot of people, you know, have said to me that, you know, they could relate to um, my story and things that we don't think are important, you discover as you get older, they are, you know, all of the small things. And so writing, well, actually doing the Audible for Growing Up X just a few weeks ago was, it was, it was really interesting. You know, parts of it, I laughed. And then I got a little emotional, um, but it was really great. It was great because I have five sisters and that was in itself exciting growing up together. Um, and then also just realizing the values that were important to my father, you know, Malcolm X and my mother, Betty, Dr. Betty Shabazz, um, what she thought was important, you know, in raising us was, really, you know, it's just really, it's amazing. You know, I have to say, it was just so amazing. So, you know, your role in life isn't only daughter. Um, so what do you want your legacy to be, you know, not as the daughter of Malcolm X, not as the daughter of Dr. Betty Shabazz? What do you want, um, you know, the world to remember you as? Well, you know, I'm honest. And just as my father and my mother loved, um, you know, that, that's really, you know, what this is all about at the end of the day. It's wanting to make sure that future generations can realize um, um, the benefits of my parents' work. And um, yeah, because I think that my parents' work gives one a sense of, um, of pride and purpose uh, at the end of the day when society for so long had said differently. And, and it was President Obama who actually said when he was growing up, he would be in his bedroom. His grandparents would be out in the, you know, in the house and he would be in his bedroom reading. And they thought he was doing his homework and he was actually you know, trying to come to terms with his identity as a brown, as a black man. And many books that he read, he found that these men grew weary at the end of their life, but when he read the autobiography of Malcolm X, in so many words, it gave him pride. You know, he, he, he stood firm in his identity and it made his life more purpose driven. And so that is really my wish that all children will have the same opportunity to understand their value, to love who they are, to, um, to know that they're worthy of a quality education, universal spirit and intellect was, you know, a part of our culture, a part of our heritage. And so it's just to pass that legacy on to others. 
great. Uh, so thank you so much for talking. <laughs> You're welcome, Cage. <laughs> it was a pleasure. This was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, this was great. I like these kind of interviews. <laughs>